Hey guys, we just have one quick short wrap up on the very tail end of nickel based super alloys. A couple quick topics. It shouldn't be more than about 15, 20 minutes or so. Now that I'm uh, feeling better, um, this stuff isn't real critical for the exam, but you know, give it a quick, quick once through listen to. There's some things that you might find. Uh, useful but again i want to stress it's nothing that is going to be a um in-depth lab question for you so last week we just finished up we went through uh manufacturing of uh disc alloys we talked about powder metallurgy and and uh, uh a little bit about metal spray forming and and basically talked about how the big balance with disc alloys and, and disc applications is that the turbine disc is uh, this balance between fatigue and creep. And fatigue is always going to be the low cycle fatigue specifically is always going to be the primary design constraint. But as operating temperatures get higher and higher, we need to consider the creep life of discs and remember that uh creep and fatigue are going to place different um constraints on the microstructure right most specifically uh fatigue low cycle fatigue is going to favor a fine grained microstructure whereas uh creep we want to eliminate as many grain boundaries as possible and want a large uh grain structure and that's what's driving the interest in dual fate dual um microstructure discs that have large grain near the rim for creep and fine grain near the bore for uh fatigue and we talked about the transition from cast and wrought discs to powder metallurgy discs and this was um uh, basically to uh, help improve the creep properties. And uh, but this uh, led to issues, most of which being cost, but all of the current generation uh, commercial aircraft engines all have powder metallurgy discs. So for the last couple slides, we want to talk about um, um, airfoils right remember the disc is what holds the the airfoils the turbine is what's actually in the hot gas the little flying wings basically you know they're little um right they look like this and they basically are, are airfoils that spin through the air and generate uh, uh thrust as the um hot gas is expanded across them and there's two types right so the high pressure turbine these are typically the smaller blades i'll bring one in on wednesday to show you um they're air cooled they don't have a tip shroud on them and they have a uh, thermal barrier coating right and this is all to because the operating temperature is for civilian engines is pretty close to the melting temperature of the of the uh of the blade of the nickel for military engines they can be prime reliant on the thermal barrier coatings um and actually have the operating temperature be slightly higher than the melting temperature of the of the blade and then the low pressure turbine this is farther back these are lar la larger. They're not actively cooled. Let me see if I have the picture here at the very beginning. Scroll all the way back here. Oh, I don't. There it is. The low pressure turbine back here. These are larger blades and they have this shroud 
around the tip for for airflow maintenance, right? And they they don't see the extreme uh, in temperature. They typically don't have a thermal barrier coating on them. They're not actively cooled, so they're they're not hollow with cooling air blowing through them. And they have a environmental barrier coating on them for uh, hot corrosion protection, not uh, not for thermal barrier, not as a thermal barrier. So those are the the parts of the engine that we're concerned with now. All right, the initial, when super alloys were first introduced, they were cast and there was a lot of work spent trying to get a equiaxed, large grained equiax structure. Then in the 70s directional solidification, took over where you have these large columnar grains where you basically have grains that stretched all the way from the root to the tip right and again this was all to maximize creep because the larger we made the grains the better the creep performance and now ever since the late 80s or so everything has been single crystal or monocrystal right and this is uh cast as a a single crystal um and it's really cool how they do this they actually um uh i'll try and find the youtube video and show it on uh wednesday but they cast it through a little loop to loop a spiral and as it solidifies Basically, the grains grow, the direction of thermal gradient takes them into the wall of the spiral, so only one orientation survives uh, as they as they grow out. Okay. So they do need to have significant heat treatments because as cast, we can see our primary and secondary dendrite arms. Here, there's our primary dendrite spacing, all right? So the thicker the part of the casting, the larger the primary dendrite arm spacing is gonna be, coarser carbide, carbides, larger eutectic regions, and, and lots of solute segregation, right? And all of that is not good for properties, right? Even after, significant normalization and solution heat treatment uh there can still be inhomogeneities right so you can still even in the final blade you can still see the the primary dendrite arms so just a reminder i would be remiss to go through an entire semester of physical metallurgy and not talk a little bit about solidification right and where this segregation comes from, right? So remember, if we cooled infinitely slowly, right? And we were always at equilibrium, right? We come down at some composition, let's say composition uh, B, right? As we come down, we hit our liquidus line we're going to start solidifying and we're going to be nucleating solid at composition A. All right, and as we cool down here, we're gonna be, our solid is gonna be at composition C here and our liquid is going to be at composition D, All right? And eventually we're gonna come down here and the last liquid that's gonna form is going to be out here at composition E. And notice this is much richer in solute than our average composition of B, right? And that the first uh, solid that formed is going to be significantly leaner. 
right? So if we uh, cool down infinitely slowly, that's what it looks like. If it cools down in, if we cool down at any kind of finite rate, right? Remember your Schlyle equation. We can actually have eutectic uh, composition, right? Even though we're f our average composition is far away from the uh, from the eutectic, right? So during solidification, that basically means so if we're solidifying this way, right? Here's our low temperature. Here's our high temperature. Remember, our direction of heat flow is this way, right? Heat flows down the temperature gradient. Here's our solid, right? This is going to nucleate at composition A, right? Our average liquid well away from our solute front is gonna be at composition B, right? But right, in front of that, we're rejecting solute, and we have composition, we have a much richer region, solute rich region right in front of the curve. And as we go along, we're pushing this, uh, this solute front forward, right? If we all right, this is the same uh, mechanism that allows us to do zone refining and produce very high purity metals. But in terms of solidification, what we have to worry about is compositional supercooling, right? So remember from our phase diagram that the higher the composition, right, the lower our freezing temperature is, right? So if our composition's out here, we're gonna have right. So our with increasing composition, our solidus line moves to lower temperatures and our liquidus line moves to lower temperatures. Right? So as we basically this is our temperature gradient of our liquid right here, but due to that composition, this is the freezing temperature of our liquid, right? Here's our solid liquid interface, right? We've got a big composition profile up here. So we've rejected solute from the solid into the liquid in front of this liquid solid interface. And so now we have this region of undercooling here, right? And this gives us our unstable, uh, solid liquid interface, right? So then this is compositional undercooling. Again, you've seen it before. I'm sure Professor Lau talked your ear off about um, uh, solidification and casting. But again, I, I couldn't let an entire semester of physical metallurgy go by without reminding you of uh, solute rejection and compositional supercooling. Okay. So airfoil technology has greatly improved. We're moving to much higher temperatures. As I mentioned before, um, the operating temperatures of turbines have grown, grown significantly. Part of that has to do with the development of higher temperature alloys, right? Remember, we're adding more refractory elements, tungsten, tantalum, rhenium. Rhenium is that magic pixie dust that gives us beautiful creep properties, right? Tungsten and tantalum slow down diffusion, right? The problem is, remember, these are the same guys that are bad for TCP phase formation, right? First generation disc alloys did not exhibit sigma phase. Current generation discs do 
and they have to be careful about their processing. Our current generation blade alloys do, and we have to be careful about their processing because of the presence of this of these refractories. Okay. We're pulling chromium out to help with uh, which means that we're ex we have worse oxidation and corrosion properties. Remember, chrome is the the magic in stainless steel, right? And so we have, in general, much higher risk of microstructure instability. We've got corrosion. We've got phase uh, formation, segregation. Uh, so problems that we have to work with all because we want the higher temperature creep resistance. In parallel, much better cooling designs, right? So which means we have larger temperatures between the temperature that the, our nickel super alloy actually sees and the hot gas that it's operating in, right? Cost is a huge thing. I'll show you figures, right? These very detailed cooling channels uh, through there that have to be cast, right? And then the big is the, the big benefit is the use of thermal barrier coatings, right? Which the coatings unfortunately don't last as long as the blade. So when engines come in for service, you have an engine rebuild. These thermal barrier coatings as part of that rebuild will often be stripped and reapplied. Um, and for, uh, again, military applications where the blade itself is prime reliant on the coating, meaning that if the coating fails, the blade fails, uh, we have um, a lot of maintenance and inspection costs that go along with that. Whereas in commercial engines, if the, if the coating spalls, the blade won't uh, the blade won't instantly instantly fail. And this just basically shows the temperature capabilities, right? These are sort of the third generation. Uh, Capabilities, so we're the operating temperature is well above a thousand C, right? And uh, we're sort of reaching the limits of super alloy for blade uh, capabilities, right? It won't be won't be long before we need some we need some kind of game changer to keep seeing the same progress. Um, in uh, in engine development, right? But I mean, if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, right? We've gone from eight hundred and ninety to ten fifty, from nineteen seventy nineteen sixty nine to to two thousands. We're a little bit higher now, but not any significant amount. So really. It's been sort of incremental changes, right? What's really pushed the engine temperatures higher, right? Military engines that might be operating at 1500 is the cooling and the uh, thermal barrier coatings, right? What the blade alloys have been buying us has been improved creep resistance and improved strength at these temperatures, right? But the actual max temperature that the alloys can see has not really increased as dramatically as the temperature, the operating temperature of the turbines uh, has gone up. There's been a lot of other sort of behind the scenes advances there. Okay. So if we look at the uh, the blade itself, right? This is the most intricate castings you'll ever see, right? These holes here are typically not cast, right? But what is cast are these cooling channels here, right? So the blade is hollow. The bleed air, cooling air, um, 
which is from bypass air from the, the turbine comes up, right? And blows, comes up and cold air comes up through these channels and blows out the holes on the leading and, and trailing edge. And on the concave surface, on the convex surface, there aren't any uh, cooling holes. These holes are then put in after the casting and heat treatment, these are done by laser drilling most of the time, right? Um, and so these the casting, the dimensional tolerance on these castings is exceptionally high. Um, and, you know, you can see these little uh, bits here. I'm sure they have a name, but I don't know what they are right, to disrupt the, the airflow and force air appropriately out the, the trailing edge uh, cooling channels, right? So this is a huge um, improvement in casting technology. Thermal barrier coatings are not by any stretch of the imagination simple either, right? So here we see our, super, our nickel super alloy, this is a turbine blade alloy, Right, our thermal barrier coatings up here. This is typically uh, YSZ or yttrium stabilized zirconia, although there are um, next generation uh, coatings used for military aircraft for the most part, um, which are uh, gadolinium oxide based. Um, YSZ, you may remember, is a uh, um, anti-fluorite uh, structure. It goes through the, the zirconia is there to um, inhibit the martensitic transformation from cubic to tetragonal. Um, that occurs in, uh, sorry. The yttria is there to suppress the martensitic transformation that zirconia um, goes through. It's about 7% uh, percent yttria. The thing is, it doesn't stick to the blade alloy, right? So there's a aluminide pack coating and then a bond coating that needs to, to go on. Then those has to be this bond coat then gets diffusion bonded to the blade. The blade then gets shot peened to make it nice and smooth. Then the top coat is put on either by the first generation of the uh, first generation technology was plasma spray, thermal spray, which gave a basically a solid coating. The way it's been done for about 10 years now, maybe a little longer, is by electron beam physical vapor deposition, which gives you this nice columnar structure, right? So basically you have a electron beam that vaporizes a ceramic ingot. The blades are then spun in, the, in vacuum above in this vapor cloud that's coming off the, the ingot and it is deposited and grows uh, from the surface, forming this nice columnar grain structure. The columnar grain structure is important for spall resistance because the, the thermal expansion of the alloy is different than that of the bond coat, is different than that of the thermal barrier coating. So, as things expand at different rates uh, with the thermal spray um, coatings, the biggest failure mode was actually after numerous cycles of this expansion and, and contraction, the coating would just spall off. It would flake. It would flake off. Right. And the other thing is we're now also introducing a galvanic couple. So we've got corrosion issues. Uh, that happen right at high temperatures. So everything has to be 
uh, oxidation resistant. Okay, so where are we going? Um, it's basically right now uh, small changes, improvements in design, complex cooling, reducing cost and producibility, um, making the coatings and cooling act as one uh system rather than as two separate things um personally i feel uh this is sort of an older slide cmc's or ceramic matrix composites these are flying now ge is now flying uh solid cmc um, blades for military applications that are flying at 1500, 1500 C with no active cooling, no thermal barrier coating. Um, so these are silicon carbide, silicon carbide composites, as odd as that sounds, they're silicon carbide fibers that are formed into the shape. And then, uh, Molten silicon carbide is is melt and in, is infiltrated into the fibers, um, and the magic there is how fracture is mitigated. So these there's special coatings that are highly proprietary and no one knows uh, what they are that makes the fibers slip in the matrix, um, giving a little bit of ductile response. And uh, um, resiliency and damage tolerance uh, to these composites. So these are, are um, I think, what we're going to see in the future. I think the life, the the ultimate life of uh, nickel super alloys being the big kid on the block is is going to be um, not too much not too much longer. Titanium aluminide, there's still a lot, a lot going, going on there. Um, a lot of, lot of issues with titanium aluminide. I'm going to sort of skip over to that. Okay. Um, there's yeah, nothing we really talked about. It's really just cost, uh, removing the, moving refractory elements in and chromium out means we have, uh, oxidation issues and uh the operating range uh oops ah. where are we right uh pushing the operating range means that the cooling air is not uh right that this we we don't have um, right, the more you compress, the more compression you get, the higher the temperature of the cooling air is going to be, the less your delta between your hot gas and your, and your, your cooling air, right? So there's issues with balancing the tur the pressure with, uh, the amount of cooling that you need. And Jim Williams, I think probably he, he says it here, one more generation of new, of, of nickel base super alloys before we need to to find something something else so a great opportunity space to play it all right corrosion's a big thing right we talked about that um we really we have to we've got high temperature corrosion and, and low temperature i'm not so worried about the specifics here just keep in mind oxidation and hot corrosion are what we have to worry about um, and I think that basically wraps up the blade alloys. Um, so these are still cast, unlike the discs, which are now powder, uh, powder metal or powder metallurgy. These are single, single crystal blades, uh, big improve, big 
improvement of solidification technology. So we have our monocrystal airfoils. Huge improvement in um, temperature capability, partially due to better alloys, um, but mostly due to improved casting and cooling capability, thermal barrier coatings. The alloys are really contributing to service life, service uh, uh, life. Um, environmental coatings to reduce hot corrosion and uh, alternate materials are beginning to, to gain acceptance and we'll, we will uh, continue to see this. And I think the, the big exciting thing is the, the development of, of CMC technology for aircraft engines. So that wraps it up. Um, and uh, have a good one. Study hard for the exam.